Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to help you lead more confidently and make a bigger difference, both professionally and personally. This episode is sponsored by Kevin's free weekly e-newsletter, Unleashing Your Remarkable Potential, which is full of articles and resources to help you become a more confident and successful leader. Sign up by going to remarkablepodcast.com forward slash newsletter. And now here's your host, Kevin. Innovation. You may see this as a scary word or an exciting one. You may see it as an organizational thing or a personal thing. Regardless of how you see it now, you're going to see it differently to be something more productive, more personal, in just a few minutes. Welcome to another live episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. You can get all future live episodes and therefore interact with us and see them sooner than if you're just on the podcast by joining our Facebook and LinkedIn groups. You just go to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn to do that. And if you're here with us live while you're here, just imagine you're joining us for a cup of coffee, or in my case, tea. Just share your questions, your comments, and your ideas. They'll make for a better conversation with our guest, uh, and eventually, it'll make it a better podcast as well. You can be a part of what we're doing today. And today's episode is brought to you by Remarkable Masterclasses. Each month, we release a new skill in an advanced form of a masterclass format designed to help you become the remarkable leader and human you were born to be. Details on how to get on board for a specific skill or get discounts each month can be found at remarkablemasterclass.com. And speaking of guests, I should bring him in. Uh, You may know already that his name is Josh Linkner. Let me tell you about Josh and then we will dive in. He is a creative troublemaker. I don't know what that portends for Kevin for the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, He started his career as a jazz guitarist and then went on to become the founder and CEO of Five tech companies, which sold for a combined value of over $200 million. He's also a deeply experienced business leader, venture capitalist, top-rating keynote speaker, New York Times bestselling author, and, as I said before, a professional jazz guitarist. He is is a world-renowned expert on innovation, disruption, and hyper-growth for leadership and has delivered over a 1,000 keynotes to companies and organizations across sectors, including ABC, Heineken, American Express, Mercedes-Benz, in the U.S. State Department. His latest book is Big Little Breakthroughs, How Small Everyday Innovations Drive Oversized Results. Josh, welcome. So glad that you're here, sir. Kevin, thank you so much. What a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I am I am excited to have you here. I, I didn't tell you this before we started. I've been a fan of yours for a while. Read your newsletter. And so when I found out about the new book, I'm like, yeah, we want to have him on. So uh, I'm excited to have you on. But before we do that, the your, your bio sort of drops some breadcrumbs for us, but you didn't wake up in high school in Detroit and figure you're going to be writing books about innovation, I'm guessing. So like, tell us a little bit about the journey that leads you here. Yeah. So as I mentioned, I grew up, I, I was born in the city of Detroit, not the suburbs. And I grew up loving music and I love technology. And on the music front, I, I would, just constantly tinker and play and, and eventually got myself into the local uh, college jazz band, the Wayne State University Jazz Band, even though I was in high school. And I started oh. playing gigs early on and eventually went up to the Berkeley College of Music. So I was a very serious musician. I still play today, 40 some years later. I'm very passionate about the art form. But I was also sort of a technology geek. I, I wrote software for a bulletin board system, which was the precursor to the internet, like in 1982 on an Atari 800. So I've always been sort of a tech nerd, creative type. And and that actually set me up very well for, for the business world. So, I mean, in a, in a nutshell, you, you, you hit it right on the head. I started my first company at age 20. I'd never taken a business class. I didn't know what I was doing, but I just went ahead and figured it out. And, and I've had the great privilege to, uh, to build five companies of my own, help about 100 startups get off the ground, create 10,000 jobs in the process, and now write four books. So it's been, a, it's been a, quite, the, quite the ride. So, so speaking of books, we, I've already mentioned the new one. So um, sometimes I ask people what the big idea of their book is, but it seems to me that I should ask you what's the big little idea of the book, Josh. That's exactly right. I'm glad you said that. So, so the title is Big Little Breakthroughs, How Small Everyday Innovations Drive Oversized Results. And the whole notion of it, it sort of flips innovate, the, what we think of innovation upside down. 
Most of us think that innovation only counts if it's a billion dollar idea or if it changes the world. Most of us think that innovation is outside of our grasp. If we're not Elon Musk or wearing a lab coat or something, how could we be innovative? And this is the opposite. It's a very pragmatic approach to help everyday people become everyday innovators. And, and the whole principle is instead of these wild swing for the fences, risky bets, it's taking lots of small creative daily acts, micro innovations. And when we cultivate a lot of small ideas rather than shooting for the, you know, swinging for the fences, it's way less risky. It's way more accessible to us all. It, these small wins add up to great big things and we're building critical skills at the same time. So to me, it's a much more sort of thoughtful approach to cultivate and deploy this superpower that we all have of human creativity. So I don't know this, um, but I'm going to guess this, that you're like me and that you didn't just write this book on innovation. You've been studying innovation. I've actually been doing it, but you've been studying it for a long time. I as have I. I've got, I could look across the room here and see a half a shelf of books about innovation. One of the things though, that I think makes this different, not just because it's a different person writing it, it's because we know so much more about the brain than we did say five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years ago. And you talk about it very briefly early on. And I think it's useful, it's useful context for us as we were having this conversation to talk a little bit about what I think will surprise some people, which is, I guess why I'm asking, is about the neuroplasticity I can't say it very well. Neuroplasticity of our brains. And what do we know about our brains now as it relates to innovation that maybe people aren't even aware of? Yeah, you're exactly right. And, and, and we often think that some of us are born creative and the rest of us are not, as if it's a fixed skill. And what um, I've learned now in 20 plus years of studying human creativity, and even for this book, I did over a thousand hours of research uh, b- before writing the first word. But the... Um, so there's this concept in, in, in brain science, neuroscience, which, as you mentioned, has come to the forefront in recent years with advances in technology, fMRI machines, et cetera, called neuroplasticity, which is essentially the notion that, that your brain is not fixed, but it can change and grow based on behavior and learning. And, and it, as it relates to creativity, I created, a, I coined a new phrase called inoplasticity, which is the same thing for your, your level of creativity. In other words, what, whatever you were born with is great. That's a good start, but, but you can develop those skills. I like to tell people that creativity is much more like your weight than your height. So for me, I'm 5'5 five five on a good day. I'm not going to grow a foot by next month as hard as I try. But my The NBA is out of reach, NBA, Josh. not going to happen. But your creativity absolutely can can fluctuate just like your weight can based on your behavior and exercise and such. And so the cool thing that what that means for all of us is that with a little extra effort, we can a little extra practice, not a lot, even not a huge investment or anything. You can start to develop and cultivate these these skills. And when you do, it's not just for the sake of it. To me, I don't encourage people to like run down the hall of their office building and draw on the walls with purple crayons. But what, what I look at it is that this becomes a significant competitive advantage as a leader and also as a contributor, especially in a world of such dizzying speed and complexity and competition coming out of COVID, et cetera. We, we know for sure that we can no longer simply rely on the models of the past and expect the same results. So I believe if we cultivate through this principle of inoplasticity, we build those skills a little bit, we can really drive the outcomes that we care about the most. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mentioned it in the open, you just said it as well, that this applies to us personally and professionally with our teams and across an organization. We'll sort of hit on all of that as we go. For those of you that are here live, if you've got questions, you need to ask them because chances are, if you've got the questions, so does somebody else. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll weave them in as we go. Uh, One of the things that, that Josh, I, I guess I realized this, but you put words on it uh, that I think is, was really helpful. You talked about two, two kinds of innovation, offensive innovation and defensive innovation. Let's talk about that because I think most people only really think of one of these. Yeah, that's right. So uh, in the book, what I've tried to do is you, know, you take a topic as squishy as creativity. And it's so hard. You think, oh, it's mythical. How do you get your arms around it? And I tried to take a rather scientific, although not boring, but a you know, scientific approach to like, all right, how can we really study this and, 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 and take it apart so we can better get our arms around it? And one of the things that, you know, to, to your point, most of us think of innovation in a typical way, which is which I call offense focused innovation, which is inventing a new product or a marketing campaign, for example. And these are things that generally are focused on growth. Nothing wrong with that. That's awesome. 
But the often overlooked uh, cousin, or you know, the inverse of that is defense-focused innovation. In other words, applying the principles of innovation, not to growth, but to other stuff. For example, let's say you run a construction site and you're trying to reduce safety hazards. Perfect place for innovation. Let's say you run a factory or manufacturing process and you want to um, create more efficiency. Awesome place for innovation. Let's say you're an HR leader and you want to create you know, a more effective pipeline of future talent and helping people um, upskill more uh, aggressively. Well, again, perfect place for innovation. So I think of this principle, you know, creativity and, and innovation, kind of like a ray gun. And most people tend to shoot the ray gun at the same spot, which is, again, a marketing campaign or a product. Again, that's great. Nothing wrong with that. But, but I, I do think that we are often missing other places to aim that ray gun that can be really helpful. And a good way to think about it is whatever you're trying to change or achieve in, in your business or your life, you can use this ray gun. You could apply it to your health. You could apply it to becoming a better parent. You could apply it to becoming more effective in your community or your church. So I think the point is that when we, when we harness this, this ability, this power, then we can direct it at whatever outcomes uh, matter most to us. And of course, the one that makes me that I immediately think of on the defensive side is okay, everybody, in case you haven't noticed, for the last year, you've been working someplace different. Uh, and perhaps there's, well, I actually, I know I've seen lots and lots of it, and we've fortunate been, been fortunate to help a lot of organizations have some def defense focused innovation around this new world of work. And I think there's a lot more opportunities to do that in the next, in the coming months. So th that's just one more example, Josh, to what you're, what you're saying that it's all around us and a great place to do that. I think you're exactly right. I mean, especially coming out of the COVID crisis, you know, to me, what's happened is that the world has hit a giant, hit a giant reset button. And in other words, the patterns of the past have been, has, have been changed. And we, we, no one asked for that. No one said, Hey, can I just have a pandemic? That, that'd be great. Of course not. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it happened and we have to adapt to it. And, and the thing that happens is that when, when patterns are broken, new possibilities emerge. So the way we lead, the way we interact, the way we sell, the way we collaborate, the way we eat, the way we love, the way we laugh, it's all been changed. And therein not only is, is, has been a challenge, but, but lies an opportunity. It reminds me real quick, I, I was just read this article recently, the London subway system, affectionately known as the underground or the tube. Um, they had a few years back, they had a, a labor strike. And the labor strike, uh, they ended up having to shut down some, but not all of the, of the uh, subway lines. And it turns out that 2 million people a day rely on that system to commute, to get to their job. And so when some of these systems are shut down, they had to find a new route. Well, the way the subway works there is that people have to swipe in and out every time they, they enter and exit the train. So they actually have a lot of data on what people are doing. So as you might imagine, during the strike, when some trains were shut down, co commuters found a new route. They had to. But when they went back, when all the trains were open, you would guess that everybody went back to their old way. But th what they found is that 100,000 people didn't. In other words, because of this forced situation that no one asked for, just like COVID, they were actually able to find better, different routes that were more effective and better suited for them. And they stayed with it. So again, no one likes COVID. I'm, I'm not like pro-COVID, pro but I do think the opportunity for us is that because of those patterns being broken, it allows us that same chance that the London Underground folks had, which is discover to discover a new and fresh and better route. You wrote about that in your newsletter just recently, as since I mentioned your newsletter earlier. Uh, and, and, you know, what strikes me is, okay, 2 million, 100,000, 5%, if I get my math right quickly there. And and I think I, I think we'll look back at what work looks like, say, in 2022 or 2023, and we'll say it'll be more than 5% that made a change in this case. But it's a perfect example of until we're forced, we may not make a change, right? We may not learn anything. And speaking of learning, that's where I wanted to go next. You talk about a rule that you call the 70-30 rule. A lot of us are familiar with the Pareto principle, 80-20, but you've got this rule that I found really fascinating that you call the 70-30 rule. Yeah, you're exactly right. So many people know the 80-20 rule, you know, 80% of your net profit maybe comes from 20% of your best customers, et cetera. But here's the 70-30 rule. Imagine where we are today and now imagine 12 months looking forward. If all we do in those next 12 months is what we already know, what our training already suggests, what our game, game plan already dictates, I would suggest that we are likely only going to achieve about 70% of the full results that we seek. In other words, that 30% that's remaining, that becomes the creativity gap. 
That's the stuff that we need to adapt to changing circumstances, that we need to pivot and adjust in real time, that we need to deploy daily creativity. For example, a year ago, it would have been difficult to plan for the impact of the pandemic. Those that adapted quickly did all right, and those that didn't really suffered. And I think the same is true on a regular basis. Here's the thing, though, that every year that compounds. So in other words, if you had a lot of success in the past, you've got good momentum, and, and you just kind of again, only look at what's happened in the past, you still can pass with a C minus letter grade, not the best thing in the world, but the lights are still on. But now that 30% gap compounds, so the next year and the year after that and the year after that, that eventually, you know what that looks like? That looks like Pan Am Airlines. That looks like Oldsmobile. Whereas if you really in, enjoy that 30% and fill it, in other words, you, you, you prioritize creativity in yourself and your team, you cultivate it as a, as, a, as a meaningful resource and you close that gap. Now you're putting points on the board and that momentum, that, 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 that compounding interest plays to your favor. So I you know, said simply, I think it's a core responsibility of leaders these days in a world where many of the advantages that we enjoyed of the past to become commoditized, outsourced, or automated that we owe it to ourselves and our team to, to, to build the conditions and, and sort of cultivate human creativity, not only to fill this year's 30% gap, but to set us up for sustainable success. Uh, you know, I think that's, I think that's so right. You know, the, uh, all of, I hope everyone is seeing how all the stuff that Josh is talking about so far connects. So let me just connect some of the dots. Neuroplasticity says we can learn. 70, 30 rule says, Oh, you better learn. And, and a lot of us have probably read the, the work of Carol Dweck that says, you know, fixed mindset, growth mindset. Everything we've talked about so far has, has been growth mindset. And it's not just a mindset. There's science there. Right. And the science says, oh, yes, you can get better at this. In fact, we probably were better at it as little kids than we are now. And so there's all that. So there's a chapter in the book that. I think is especially interesting and it ties to all of those dots I just tried to connect about, okay, if we buy your idea, Josh, that we can become more innovative, how do we do it? Like, how do we build this muscle, if you will? Like, give us some thoughts. I know that you've got a a, a creativity workout. We can get there if you want, but any, where do you want to go in terms of helping people build this muscle, maybe for themselves and across the team? Yeah, excellent question. So first of all, the, here's the good news. If I asked you to learn a new language like Mandarin, you're starting from scratch. That's a big climb. But if I ask you to build your creativity abilities, you already have much of that developed. We, we were all, you've never met an uncreative four-year-old. And so it's more about reconnecting to something that's already there and layering on some new mindsets, tactics, and habits. And so it's not as big of a lift as like learning something entirely new. So I just want to, first of all, say that it's not an overwhelming thing to do. And many of us can can see huge gains very quickly. I'm just real quickly, there was, I covered many studies like this in the book, but a study by the university, a university in Italy, and they took a group of like-minded people, almost identical in every area, demographics and such. And like most studies, they, they separated them into two. They were each shown a video and then asked to take a standardized creativity test. One group was shown a really boring video, like watching sheep grazing in the meadow. And the other one was shown a really inspiring video, like majestic cliffs and you know, waterfalls and stuff. That was the only difference. But meanwhile, the awe-inspired group outperformed the boring group by 80% on this test. So the cool thing is that a, a little bit of adjustments can make a very quick and meaningful difference into our creativity output. Anyway, the answer to your question though, it gets into three things. We, we got to examine our mindsets. We got to examine our habits and we got to examine our tactics. And that sounds like kind of overwhelming, but in, you know, in the book I cover, it, it's pretty simple. And I'm happy to walk you through any and all of those, but just in terms of habits, maybe we'll just start there. You know, when I was learning to play guitar, I could have, have a killer guitar lesson. But if I didn't practice every day, if it wasn't part of my daily routine, I would forget it very quickly. So what I do, actually, I do a five minute a day creativity ritual. That's it, five minutes a day. You can borrow mine or do your own. But the point is just a little teeny bit of practice on a daily basis can go a very long way in terms of dry, driving a creative output. So you brought something up. You can see I'm taking notes here. Um, you, you, yeah, in the book. And, and by, by the way, everybody, we're talking to Josh Linkner author of the brand new book, Big Little Breakthroughs, How Small Everyday Innovations Drive Oversized Results. And, and the book would be worth it just to read the like four pages about your routine. Uh, and I don't think everything about it would surprise people, some of it, but you've 
got some pieces in there that I'm not sure. I mean, you created, so they're going to be different than anyone's seen before. That's um, worth the read in itself. But you said something a minute ago when you were talking about watching the movie and then that impacting our immediate creativity and innovation thereafter. Talk about environment a bit as it relates to this, because so many of us, I mean, there, there used to be lots of literature about offices, not very creative. Everyone's in their office. Now everyone's in there. Not everyone. Many people are in their house. What's your take uh, on environment and innovation and how can we leverage what we might have now that's different in that regard? Yeah, the simple answer is that environment really does matter. I mean, we, we've learned that for thousands of years, famous musicians and playwrights went to inspiring places to do inspiring work, which kind of makes you wonder, why does most of corporate America look like a sensory deprivation chamber? <laughs> Yeah. Let's go into a tan conference room with no windows. Right. Bad fluorescent lighting. You know, you're an uncomfortable desk and there's no stimuli whatsoever. You know, how painful. You know, meanwhile, look at a kindergarten classroom. It's full of richness and color and things to touch and it's tactile and sensory rich. But anyway, you don't have to necessarily decorate your office like Google or have a foosball table to, to get creative. What I really recommend doing is, is shifting things up a little bit. Even if like I take my team on field trips all the time. Because there are times when you're in the office, you need to do heads down work. Awesome. But there's also times in life we need to be heads up. And in that case, I might say, hey, let's go to the Detroit Institute of Art and go walk around there for the day. Let's have a meeting at the Motown Museum. Let's go for a walk out in nature. And so even free stuff, it doesn't have to be expensive. Shaking up your environment can absolutely stimulate better creativity. You ever wonder why people always say, oh, I had this great idea. I was on vacation. I was in the shower. I came up with this great idea. When was the last time you heard someone say, okay, I'm sitting at my desk. I'm responding to email. My boss is yelling at me. My phone's ringing off the hook. My neighbor's bumping into me. I can smell out a guy's tuna sandwich. And bam, I'm hit with a lightning bolt of inspiration. Like zero times in the history of the universe. Yeah, so anyway, ever. Exactly. for leaders, I think the point is, you know, just, just the more we can create stimulus that is, that is uh, uh, enriching and, and inspiring, the more inspired the work product will be. I just want to make a, a point to everybody here. And if, you, and if you've got a thought about this, Josh, I'd love to hear it. You know, one of the things that's going to happen as we send people back to the office or some portion of them, a lot of organizations are going to reduce their office footprint. We're going to have this new word hoteling happening. And what that's going to do, I'm afraid, is make it even more sterile. Because at least when you had your own desk, you had some stuff, some personal stuff on the desk. You're not going to have time for that now. You're going to whip in, whop out the laptop and go to work. And the, it, I, I think there's another... I'm not saying we shouldn't do hoteling, but I'm saying that adds to your point of, of a negative unintended outcome. 100%. And, and by the way, that's an easy thing for leaders to change. I, funny that you say that. I was talking to a guy who, who manufactures, they're sort of like telephone booths for offices. And it's perfect for hoteling. If you have like an open floor plan, you can get in there and it's like quiet and you can make a phone call or whatever. But they look like the most boring beige, like it was awful. And I said, what if you just made them look like one of those telephone booths in London, like the bright red ones? Like, wouldn't that be better? And he sort of gave me this puzzled look. And I said, well, like, why don't you just change the colors or do something to create some level of stimuli? And, and I think that's, that's something we can do as leaders. It doesn't have to be expensive, but it absolutely yeah. can be effective. Absolutely. So uh, Nathaniel sent a question and it's longer. I'll read it and let you just comment on it, Josh. He says, how to build the innovation muscles after being 58 years old, faced unemployment, just started a consulting service in the middle of a pandemic. Any specific thoughts for him? Yeah. Well, first of all, Nathaniel, you know, I, I empathize with your situation and, and I, I'm sorry, you know, it's been a tough year for, for many of us. Um, I would say this, though, that the, the, I think the principles I cover in the book might be helpful. You know, one of the reasons many of us don't, well, actually two things. First of all, uh, after 58 years, you absolutely can reconnect to your creative roots. I, I've worked with people and, you know, well into the, to the later stages of their lives and people who say, I'm not creative. I don't have a creative bone in my body. And then you give them a little bit of an exercise or a technique and they just light up. So the good news is it doesn't matter if it's been dormant for a while, you really can reconnect. But I think the approach that you take is important here because if you take the typical approach, people, again, think of innovation as these wildly risky, bet everything kind of deals. And, and I don't recommend that at all. I recommend these small, deliberate, teeny little micro innovations, little, little tiny acts. And, and think about it as experiments. You know, a lot of times people say, okay, I have an idea. And the next logical step is to, to deploy this idea in its grandest possible format. Again, the problem is the stakes are too high, so we gravitate to doing nothing. 
my suggestion instead, uh, Nathaniel, is to, to think about, okay, I've got a bunch of ideas. What are the three or four that I want to test and how quick and cheap can I test them? So if you have an idea how to win a new consulting client for your new business, don't just try the same idea on everything. Like try it on one Tuesday afternoon with one new client and see how it works. And if it doesn't work, okay, then kill it. And if, if it looks promising, don't go crazy. Just double the size of the experiment. So I think if we think about it, a deployment of creativity in terms of small little micro tests, little, little baby prototypes or experiments, as opposed to wide sweeping change, it de-risks the process and feels much more accessible. One, one thing I talk a little bit about in the book is that many of us have a to-do list. I would suggest why not have a to-test list? So as you're coming up with ideas, don't even think about, oh, this is the idea. Now I got to make wide sweeping global change. Like just add it to your to test list. And then every now and then look at your list and say, okay, is there something I could test periodically in a teeny little way, like 15 bucks in 30 minutes and, and see if it, it shows promise or not. And when you, when you break creativity and innovation down like that, it feels so much less risky and so more accessible to us all. And I'll just layer on that. If you're here as a leader, and you're thinking about that. You got to think about this on two levels. You got to think about this for yourself because everything that Josh just said applies to you as a human slash leader. But you need to think about, are you modeling this, allowing this? Does your team feel like they can, your team has to understand the idea of the micro innovation, the, the micro risk, but do they feel comfortable like you're going to let them, right? So uh, there's there's a cultural uh, expectation piece to this is, I think, important. Yeah, you know, for those leaders, I, 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 what, what would be a higher priority than leveraging and maximizing the creative output of your team? And it always breaks my heart a little bit. You know, you have a, you have a team of a thousand employees, and four of them are allowed to be creative, and the rest of them are just supposed to put their head down and do what they're told. And, and first of all, you know, we're all trying to attract talent and, and, and drive morale and engagement. What better way is there than, than human creativity? But I look at it even more practically. Like let, let's say you had an oil well outside in, in, your, in your house, in your backyard, and you learn that there's a billion dollars of oil underneath the surface. I'm guessing it wouldn't be like, nah, maybe I, I'll get around to it in a few months. You'd be like, oh my God, like I got to tap into this right now. Yet, if you really think about it, most of us in our organizations as leaders have same, same type of thing, dormant stored creative capacity. That's the equivalent of your oil well. And so isn't it your job as a leader to, to bring that, you know, to tap into it, to, to bring it out, to put it to use, to drive competitive advantage and, and fuel growth and, and drive shareholder value and delight customers. So what I've learned often, you know, many times leaders will hire outside consultants to tell them what to do. I think most of us know exactly what to do. It just might be trapped inside of us. And if we can give our team the, the support that they need, if we can create the conditions that are, that are conducive of creativity, we'll start to see those things really take root. You know, Josh, I was just on the other side of the mic an hour or so ago being interviewed for someone else's podcast. And I found myself, I, I found myself being asked questions, give us some advice. And I would say, hey, your folks have been doing this for a year. Go ask them. I mean, I can give you thoughts. I can give you ideas. But your team has been living in this remote world for a year. Go talk to them. You don't have to have all the answers. Just ask them the right questions. Well, on that point, I just I'll share. So one of the things I, I tried to do in the book is provide some really tactical tools. So we talked about you know habits, we talked a little bit about mindsets, but you know, most of us, when you do it, if you're trying to get ideas out, what do you do? You do a brainstorm session. Here's what I learned. Brainstorming was invented in 1958. Well, I'm sorry, no offense to anyone, but a lot has changed since 1958. And, and think about how we've upgraded our technology and, and all the changes, yet we're still using this outdated and ineffective technology or tool to drive ideas. So if you say to your team, okay, you got to go brainstorm ideas. They better be good or else you're going to get nothing. Like that's awful. <laughs> so here's just one of my favorites. I cover 13 of them in the book, but um, the biggest blocker of creative output is not natural talent. It's fear. So fear is that poisonous force that sort of robs us of our best thinking. Here's the simplest technique. It's really fun too, by the way. I call it role storming. So role storming is brainstorming in character. You're brainstorming as if you are somebody else. So here's how it works. Let's say we're doing a brainstorm, Kevin, and you were playing the role of Steve Jobs. Well, no one's going to laugh at Steve for coming up with a big idea. Steve doesn't have to be ashamed for coming up with a big idea. He's not responsible for the idea. So now you, AKA Steve Jobs, you're totally liberated. You can say anything you want, no fear at all of retribution. So the way it works is that every person in the room just chooses any character they wanna be. 
You can be a villain. You could be a sports hero. You could be a supermodel. You could be a four-year-old. You could be a time traveler from the future. And you literally get in character and pretend that you are that person. And here's what happens. The, the fear leaves the building and the creativity flourishes. Real quickly, I did this with a group of executives one time at Sony Japan. I met this guy who was like the stiffest human being I've ever met. Dark suit, white shirt, his tie was choking him. Anyway, we got him roll storming as Yoda. And I, I got to tell you, I've never seen personal transformation like this. This dude jackets <laughs> off, his ties undone. He's like leaping around the room and the whiteboards were filled with ideas. He had that creativity inside him all along, as do all of us. The difference was that he was in, he was using the wrong technology. He was use, using the wrong technique. And we put him in the right technique and he was able to liberate this, this incredible gift. So since you bring up brainstorming and we could, you know, we could talk, we could have a whole conversation just about that piece. But one of the things that um, there's been lots of conversation about, and, and I've been asked lots of questions about in the last few months is, okay, well, we can't collaborate the way we could before. How do you brainstorm when we're all virtual? So just talk, let's just, let's sort of take this to where many of us are living now, which is a part, right? Um, Thoughts about innovation at a distance when we're all at a distance from each other. Any thoughts, strategies that you want to share with us there? Yeah. So one of them, I mean, there's a few. I, I think it's important to think about not only um, live ideation sessions where we can collaborate and also asynchronous ones where there may be some time delays back and forth. On the live ones, again, I think it's back to technique. Another fun example. So everybody, you know, you get in a brainstorm session and you're, you're supposed to come up with good results, good ideas, but people lock up and it's weird and we're on Zoom and all this stuff. Do this, try this. It's a, it's a brainstorm technique called the bad idea brainstorm. So it's a two-part uh, process. Part one, set a timer for like 10 minutes and everybody on the call or on the Zoom first starts by coming up with the worst ideas they can imagine. What's a terrible way to solve it? What's an awful concept? And, and you just riff on it. First, so everybody's energy goes up. You forget the fact that you're remote. It's really fun. After 10 minutes, don't do the bad ideas, to be clear. Then you study the bad ideas and say, okay, is there a little something in there that we can flip to make it a positive idea? And so, but just by a slightly better technique, you can actually unlock creativity. And this is cool because you riff on it back and forth. In other words, my I bad idea triggers something in your mind and vice versa. And it really is a very collaborative process. You know, one example of that coming to life, most restaurants, as you probably know, um, they, they share these very exaggerated, boastful claims. New York City's best slice of pizza, the world's number one cup of coffee. And we all know it's BS and it just, it just blends in. But anyway, there was a guy in, in Montreal who owned a Chinese restaurant and he was trying to promote his restaurant among the 65,000 other Chinese restaurants in North America. And he did a little bra bad idea. He's like, well, what would be the opposite of that? What would be something really bad? He's like, well, what if I criticized my own food instead of boasted about it? But this sort of struck a nerve. And, and literally today on his menu and on the online, next to every menu item, there's a section that says owner's comments, where he provides these brutally honest and hysterically funny comments. Like one of them says, yeah, compared to our General Tso's chicken, this one's just not that good. Another one's like, this is a safe choice, but you're not going to remember it. Another one says, hey, from this dish, I gained at least five pounds. But because he did this opposite, it started as a bad idea. He kind of massaged it and it became a good idea. He has 10 times the Yelp reviews of any other Chinese restaurant in Montreal. He's crushing it. When, his, when all the restaurants are empty, his is always busy. So I, at the point is, we can actually have some fun and generate some much more powerful ideas when we embrace better technique. I love it. So before we shift to the last sort of section uh, of our conversation, is there anything we didn't talk about or is there maybe one more thing that you, you sort of feel led to share that we haven't talked about that you want to talk about real quick? Yeah, sure. So in, in writing on the book, I, I spent huge amounts of time interviewing people all over the world. So I interviewed CEOs, billionaires, celebrity entrepreneurs, Grammy award winning musicians, and, and lots of like normal everyday people like, like you and me. And, and what I discovered is that there's some very common patterns or mindsets that, that innovative people of all shapes and sizes tend to embrace. I know we don't have time to cover them all, but I assure them in the book, there are eight core mindsets of everyday innovators. And most of them are counterintuitive. They're the thing that you were, you know, if you've been taught one thing your whole life, it's kind of encouraging you to do the opposite. And they, they often have, they have playful names. One of them is start before you're ready. One of them is, says, break it to fix it. So instead of that old adage that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. P.S. That's terrible advice. Like, why would you wait till something's broken to get after changing it? This encourages you to take a proactive approach and, and sort of shake things up on your own. 
Some are fun. There's one called Use Every Drop of Toothpaste. There's one called Don't Forget the Dinner Mint. But the point is that they're very simple and easy to understand concepts backed by a lot of research and real world examples that, that they allow us to make these quick little mindset shifts. And when we do that individually and as you point out across our team, it becomes very quickly a competitive advantage. Well, Josh, I think everyone should have plenty to chew on since we're talking about uh, dessert, since we're talking about uh, mints. Um, I want to shift gears with a couple of final questions. And the first of those is this. Uh, what do you do for fun? It's pretty clear that, like me, you enjoy your work. But what do you do for fun? Well, I uh, so I'm a, a very big family guy. So I have two older kids, 23 and 21. But I also have four-year-old twins, boy-girl twins, Avi and Talia. And uh, man, they they keep you busy. Uh, they're 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 little monsters most of the time. But no, they're, I love them to death, and we have a lot of fun. But I also play a lot of music. I just love music. To me, that's my muse. So there's not a, a week that goes by where I'm not playing some some jazz. And uh, I just I just love the the art of of playing. I'm challenging myself actually to something new. You know, in the book, I covered something called the 20 hour principle. So most of us heard about the 10,000 hour rule. It was popularized by Malcolm Gladwell which actually got, got uh, tr lost in translation. Originally it was, hey, if you, need to, if you wanted to become a, a world leading renowned expert at something, it, it takes 10,000 hours of study. But then most of us think, gosh, it takes 10,000 hours to learn anything new, which is totally wrong. So there's the other, other one I covered in the book by a guy named Josh Kaufman. He calls it the 20 hour rule, which basically means that if you spend 20 hours of deliberate practice on something, you're gonna be okay. Like you're not gonna be you know, playing Carnegie Hall, but you'll, you'll be a lot better than you were. So I've been taking on singing. I'm 50 years old. I never sang. And I'm like, you know what? That'd be kind of fun to learn. So I, I don't know exactly what hour I'm in right now. It's maybe somewhere between 10 and 20. And it's getting a little better. And I'm having fun. I'm having fun doing it. Now you can now you're gonna be a rock star. You can play your guitar and sing at the same time. <laughs> so um the only question, everybody, that I told Josh I was gonna ask him is this one. So what are you reading these days? So Kevin, like you, I'm an avid reader. I read usually 25 to 30 books a year. Uh, but the two that jump off that I just completed this in the last few months, um, one is by a guy named John Acuff. It's called Soundtracks. And he really thinks about, it's sort of like talking about the soundtracks that you play in your own mind. And sometimes we play uh, negative soundtracks, like I'm not good enough, I'm a fraud, I, I should be ashamed, I'm never gonna cut it. And then how do we shift those negative soundtracks into positive ones? It's a hysterically funny book. He's got a great sense of humor and I strongly encourage that one. And the other one is by a buddy of mine named Adam Grant, uh, who grew up right by me in here in Detroit. He's a Wharton professor. And his book is called Rethink. And it really gets into the point of when and how can you rethink, whether it's your assumptions about other people or whether it's uh, how you approach your work or anywhere in between. Both were terrific, fun, easy, but, but provocative reads. Highly recommend both of them. And everybody, you need to go get your copy of Big Little Breakthroughs by this guy, Josh Linkner. Uh, where do you want to point people uh, to learn more about your work, Josh? Yeah, thank you so much, Kevin. I, you know, talk, check out biglittlebreakthroughs.com. You certainly can buy the book there, but even if you don't want to, there's a whole bunch of free resources. There is... Um, there's, there's a free creativity assessment, see how you're weighing in right now. There's downloadable worksheets. There's a quick start guide. And so definitely check it out, biglittlebreakthroughs.com. I saw there's a comment here. Someone's from out of, out of the country. Um, the book has, hasn't yet been translated. I hope it will be soon into other languages, but you can also get the digital version. And on the audio version, I did something fun. I read the book myself in the studio, but I, I wanted to add a little something fun. So in between every chapter, I play a little jazz guitar. So it's uh, mostly content, but there's a little bit of creative, a little music in there as well. So does, so now it can be a New York Times bestseller and a Grammy winning oh. audio book at once. How about that? Hey, I've had Grammy winning artists on here. So Josh, you never know. Fair enough. You never know. But uh, anyway, I hope you enjoy it. And, and it's such a pleasure catching up with you. What a wonderful conversation. One question for all of you who are watching or listening, whether it's live, whether it's later, doesn't matter when. The question is, the most important question of the day is this. Now what? What are you going to do with this? What action are you going to take? You got at least a dozen practical things that you could do that Josh gave you very specifically. You could try five minutes from now. Where are you going to start? What are you going to do? And, and, and if you didn't quite catch it, you know, all you got to do is hit the replay or zoom back a little bit and listen again. But if you don't take some action here, um, kind of, with all due respect, what was the point? Uh, we're so glad that you came. And Josh, first of all, thank you for coming. It was such a pleasure to have you. 
and to spend a little time with you. It, I've been looking forward to it and it didn't disappoint. Oh, I'm very grateful. Thanks for a great conversation. And thanks, you know, again, the, the point is that we, this is such an important skill that we can all build. It's within the grasp of every one of us here today. Truthfully, we're all creative. If you're breathing, you're creative. We're hardwired to be creative. And I hope if anything, you know, everyone took the, took that away from today's discussion, uh, then it will be a good day. It will be a good day. And speaking of good days, we're here every week. And in fact, if you're watching this or listening to this, when it first comes out in July, we're celebrating five years of this podcast. So twice a week for right now, but whether it's once a week, twice a week, or you're going back into the archives, doesn't matter what, we'll be back next week. We look forward to having you join us right here on the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Thanks, everybody.